from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Anya Kreitney, Program Specialist at the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you here today for our inaugural event with literary magazine Manoa, a Pacific Journal of International Writing. This year's event will focus on Singaporean literature. Before we begin, let me mention a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We're the home of the Poet Laureate and put on literary readings, lectures, and panels of all sorts throughout the year. If you'd like to find out more about events like this one, please add your name to our email list, uh, which is by the entrance. And you can also check out the Poetry and Literature Center at www.loc.gov poetry. Now let me tell you a little bit about today's event. First, Manoa editor Frank Stewart will be joined by poet Lee G. Leong Ko and playwright tr and translator Jeremy Tiang, two contributors to Starry Island New Writing from Singapore, published in 2014 by the University of Hawaii Press. Starry Island is an anthology of poetry, fiction, and essays by 30 Singaporean writers and translators. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Ko, and Mr. Tiang will read from the issue for 30 minutes, then both contributors will participate in a discussion moderated by Mr. Stewart. We will leave time at the end to participate in a question and answer. And before I begin the obligatory reminders, I just want to say how excited we are to continue our partnership with Manoa. The Poetry and Literature Center first began this series a year ago with Katsunori Yama, Yamazoto, guest editor for the 2011 issue, and the much acclaimed poet Brenda Shaughnessy. That event, coupled with the library's International Summit of the Book, served to remind us of the enduring and powerful literature coming out of the Pacific. So now, let me formally ask you to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices you have that might interfere with our event. And second, please note that this program is being recorded, and by participating, you give us permission for future use of the recording. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Frank Stewart, Ji Leong Ko, and Jeremy Tiang. Hello, and uh, welcome. Welcome. Um, about 3% of American poetry, American publishing every year um, publishes translations, 3%. Of that amount, only a small percentage of those are um, translations of literature. And of that small percentage, a smaller percentage is primarily European languages, French, German, Spanish, etc. Now, of the percentage of that small percentage, there is a small percentage of poetry, fiction, other literature from Asian countries. That's why uh, Manoa Journal, 30 years ago, started a series that publishes primarily work from Asia and Oceania in translation. This year, we published um, the collection we're going to talk about today, Starry Island, uh, New Singaporean Literature. It's particularly important that we do this, or timely, because 2015 is the 50th anniversary of the independence of Singapore. Singapore, as you probably know, um, was a British colony for many years. After the war in 1959, uh, the British uh, left Singapore, and it became a, um, a free state that is not under British rule. It joined forces with uh, another group of islands and with Malaysia to form a federation. In 1965, Singapore uh, severed its ties with Malaysia and became an independent state. So this is uh, 50 years after that. And I'm very happy to introduce these poets today because they represent a younger generation of Singaporean writers Singapore has been very busy in the last 50 years and hasn't produced as much literature maybe as other places, but for good reasons. And now there is a generation of uh, new writers and 
in our anthology and represented today are some of these writers. Uh, after I speak, um, Ji Long Ko will speak. Let me just introduce him now. Uh, Ji is a Singapore writer who's living in New York now. He's published four books of poetry, a collection of poetic essays called The Pillow Book, which I think he'll read from. He's been shortlisted for the Singapore Literature Prize, and his work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Russian. Um, and then uh, after Ji speaks, Jeremy Tian will talk, and let me just tell you something about him quickly. Jeremy is a fiction writer, playwright, and a translator. He's translated three novels, and he has um, written short stories and plays. In 2011, he represented Singapore at the University of Iowa's International Writing Program. And in um, 2013, he was awarded a Penn Helm Translation Fund grant. Uh, you can see their biographies on the back of your program. I'd like to start by just reading two very short selections from uh, writers who aren't here. The first one is uh, by Grace Chua, and it's a poem called Instincts. That winter, the animals committed suicide. Instead of hibernating, the moles and bears embroidered their comrades' coriander shrouds. Beavers in their bundled down beds gnawed apart their own dams. Badgers roasted in their sets. Fish flung themselves on ice and lay there gasping. Frogs rustled down in their thistled holes and refused to breathe. Down the middle of the road, skunks and squirrels ventured to the line between north and death, bursting one by one as the cars trundled past red and gaping as they rolled over and over into the winter's unmade dry ditches. We anchored, unrepentant, squirming, not animal enough to live or go. They say rats jump a sinking ship, but for our cowardice, snow-laden willows hung their necks in shame. Animals uh, and Wildlife and nature appear quite a bit in Singapore writing, I've found, anyway. It has partly to do, I suppose, um, with the changes that have happened over the last 50 years in Singapore. It went from a fairly mm, swampy place in the 19th century into what we imagine now of Singapore as a place of wonderful architecture and high rises, and of course a lot of the wildlife and nature um, had to be mm, put aside. This is changing now. So the next piece I want to read is by uh, a poet, a short story writer, O Tian Chen, and I'll just read a short piece called Tiger. It was common knowledge that there was a man-eating tiger prowling in the thick forest near our village. My sister and I never saw it, but during the night, as we lay under the mosquito net on our thin straw mattress, we could hear a distant roar coming from somewhere deep in the forest. To our ears, it sounded like the roar of a famished tiger. But we might have been mistaken, since there could be all kinds of animals hiding out in the forest. Maybe as we whispered during those sleepless nights, like this, just as old wives' tales meant to scare young children. We were too old to fall for it. We chuckled at our naivete, but our minds had already taken small tentative steps into the dark forest of our imagination. My mother told us a story as she was preparing dinner at the soot-blackened brick stove in the kitchen of this young couple who fled from their families by escaping into the forest in the middle of the night. They wanted to take a shortcut through it to reach the jetty where there was a boat waiting to take them downriver to a town hundreds of kilometers away. They were in love, and so they were foolish in their actions, And my, said my mother. But they never made it to the jetty. In fact, they were never found. Men from the village combined, 
combed through the forest in broad daylight, searching for them, but they couldn't find their bodies. Everyone presumed that they were dead, eaten by the tigers. The only thing the people could find was a cotton scarf of the woman which she had worn the day before she fled, a gift from the man who had eloped with her. They had wanted to escape from the marriages arranged for them by their families. That's why you should always listen to your parents. They alone know what's best for you, said my mother as she stirred the pot of sweet potato porridge. If you go too far in your own ways, you will get lost and get eaten alive by the tiger. We took in her words and let them rest heavily on our hearts. We thought about the man-eating tiger that devoured rebellious children who strayed away from their families and broke their parents' hearts and reassured one another that the, we would never be like them. But like the clothes we outgrew over the years, the assurances we gave and the fears we had of the forest and the tiger slowly became things of the past, things we no longer had a need for. My sister, when she turned 18, disappeared into the forest with the man she loved. But unlike the unlucky couple, they didn't fall prey to the tiger. Shortly after her departure, she wrote back telling us of how happy she was living with her new husband in a tiny, faraway country called Nanyang. All right, um, I'd like to introduce now uh, Gianco. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I want to thank Frank for editing the anthology Starry Island and the Poetry and Literature Center for hosting this event, having us. I'm going to read from my collection, The Pillow Book, extracts of which were included uh, in Starry Island. The Pillow Book, as its title suggests, was inspired by the Pillow Book of Sei Shonagon, the classic uh, of the Japanese essay genre called Zuihitsu, which translated means to follow the brush, evoking a sense of spontaneity in the essayistic method. So this is the very opening section of The Pillow Book. I miss my bolster. I miss my bolster, the long pillow held between my legs and hugged to my chest from the time I was born to when I turned 33. I have the impression that it was the same pillow, although this could not be true. Perhaps it stayed the same because the slip would change. A fresh pillow slip smelled not unpleasantly of washing powder. After drying in the sun for hours on a bamboo pole, it was hot to my thighs. I also liked the sensation of it cooling, and later at night, the sensation of warming it in a cleft of my body. There was a dark brown pillow slip with overlapping white squares. Another pillow slip was blue with white balloons. My favorite had a pattern of palm leaves. Darren laughed at a bolster when he visited me from England and slept in the same room. We must get you a woman, he said. Darren has straw blonde hair and a swimmer's shoulders. At the beach, he pulled on green shorts the same lime green that Matt Damon flashed in the talented Mr. Ripley. The color picked him out in a crowd. I mean Damon, but I could have been talking about Darren. In the year I turned 33, I moved to New York City to find out if I was gay and a poet. For the first time in my life, I bought my own mattress and bed linen I learned about sizes, full, queen, 
king. Mine is twin. I have two pillows for the head, but none for the body. I could not find one, but I admit I did not look very hard. I gave the bolster up to get something better. Mount Faber is a misnomer. Mount Faber is a misnomer for the hill by which I grew up. It is not even the tallest hill in Singapore. I don't know who Faber is, but the word has always sounded delightfully like fable. I went to a very small school on the hill, Radinmas Primary School. Consisted of two distinct parts: the lower grades at the beginning of a long flight of stairs, the upper grades at the end. It was enough to teach one about large ambition and small achievement. About the efflorescence of Singapore poetry in the last two decades, the critic Gui Li Sui is right. It is not the result of cultural change. Certainly not because of government programs. It has sprung up like wild flowers on a hillside, and it may die without altering the landscape. The best of us still aim to be major generals of a reserve army, pioneers of second-rate products, prime ministers of an island. The dreamier turn to poetry. On every visit to Singapore, I make it a point of what to walk up Mount Faber, going by the road that winds the Toyotas and tour buses up. From the top, I see on one side the public housing estates, intricate and useful, and on the other, the featureless sea. Caught by the hand of the hill. As if thrown there by a storm, lodges a boat. To the hungry eye, it is a seafood restaurant. To the hungrier eye, it is an ark. I look at the sea again, and now I see the ships on the mauve horizon. I recite quietly a tanka composed a while ago. Because this country has no mountains. We think highly of hills. Look, we point to the peaks where we can live. I'll read for you a final extract from the Pillow Book. This is the old Chinese poets. The old Chinese poets composed a poem after walking just a few short steps. The closest I came to this was to write a lousy sestina in my head, after walking up and down the Bronzeville Park, bounded on one side by train tracks, and on the other by a motorway. Walking in a cemetery is charming, when there is light. In the summer, the headstones can still be scanned at eight or even nine o'clock. In the fall, the leaves litter the graves and give them a melancholic look of being forsaken. The bare branches in the winter bring out the grittiness of the stones. In the spring, when the trees put on their freshest green and the birds are almost intelligible, the cemetery turns into a sculpture garden, like the Tuileries. The deepest darkness I know is the long night marches during national service, the battalion strung out in a single file, scraping over the humpback ground, wading waist deep across a river as black as tar, pressing through impenetrable thorn. The worst thing that could happen was to lose contact. All that kept the line together. Was the blue silum straw on the back of the helmet of the man in front, and of the man in front of him? It is so comforting 
to walk along a familiar path. The mind returns from observing, deciding and judging to itself. It is like wandering out and walking home at the same time. Doing just that along the East River this morning, I made up this tanka. The sun casts shadows. And so why am I surprised that love makes darkness as if I am not in its way? Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'll be reading from the work of Dr. Wong yun which I have translated into English from the original Chinese. Dr. Wong yun is a Singaporean writer who's originally from Malaysia, our larger neighbour, and is one of our foremost poets and scholars. The book I translated was called in the Chinese Chong Fan Ti, which means literally a collection of return, though in the English edition, we gave it the somewhat racier title of Durians are not the only fruit. <laughs> to give some context, I'll read from my introduction to this English version. My mother was born in the same small town as Dr. Wong yun Timo in Perak, about 50 kilometers from Ipoh, so unimportant today that the KTM train goes right past it without stopping. I have been on that train, chugging along at a stately pace from the crumbling grandeur of Ipoh's majestic station hotel, which looks like someone put a scale model of Singapore's Istana over Ipoh train station and then didn't maintain it for 40 years. As we passed by my mother's hometown, I tried to see as much of it as I could, but only got an impression of coconut trees and faded clapboard houses. My grandfather had a shop near the station, my mother once told me, but I couldn't work out which building it might have been. Perhaps it's no longer there. When I told my mother I was translating the work of someone else from Timor, she got quite excited and wanted to know all about Dr. Wong, in such a small place, she must have known him. I started by saying he'd gone to pay you in secondary school, and her face fell. Oh, she said, that's one of the Chinese schools. I wouldn't have met him then. We all went to the English schools. This illustrates the deep fault lines that run through Singaporean and Malaysian society. Even between two people of the same ethnicity, other markers such as education and language can present an insuperable boundary. It's easy to imagine how many divisions there are in countries which successive waves of immigration have filled with a population diverse in any number of ways. Harder to come up with ways of bridging those gaps. Now to give you a flavour of the original, I'll just read a paragraph of Dr. Wong's own writing. Here he is describing his position in literature and in academia, which he says is always on the margins. Now the essay that appears in Manoa Journal Starry Island is called Cast from Paradise and tells of a night Dr. Wong spent in the jungle of Malaysia, near where he spent his childhood, but as an adult, finds it rather more difficult to get used to. We left Singapore around two in the afternoon, a day of such strong sunlight we could barely keep our eyes open. 
In order to drive safely, I put on my sunglasses. The car contained, apart from Dan Ying and myself, Professor Gu, Mrs Gu and their two children. We were excited at this rare opportunity to reconnect with nature, especially since it was neither the weekend nor the holiday season. As other people remained trapped in their busy lives, our car slipped out like a fish through a net, swimming unencumbered to the vast green sea of rubber plantations. In less than 45 minutes, we had left Singaporean soil, passed Johor Bahru, the largest city in southern Malaysia, and were heading directly north on the north-south trunk road. Rubber trees crowded densely on both sides of the road, making me feel as if we were sailing down a narrow river, the lush greenery like waves beating our little boat, the mountain ranges on either side like high, distant shores. As we surged down the rapids, I plucked off my dark glasses because the sun that had blazed so brightly when we set off was now nowhere to be seen. Arriving at Kota Tinggi, a tiny hill town, we asked many passers-by before finding the narrow road that led to the waterfall. We held our breaths until we saw a sign assuring us our destination was no more than 10 kilometers ahead. And yet, how long that 10 kilometer road was, like a gray snake winding its way through the uneven hills of the rubber plantation, its head hidden in the darkness of the jungle. During storms, this road became a channel for flood water and as a result was littered with debris and loose soil. Our car often paused at forks in the road with no indication as to whether to turn left or right. There was still a large gap of time between, before sunset, but dusk was already falling like a withered rubber leaf, drifting slowly onto the road ahead. Our cheerful voices stilled as we held our breaths, trying to detect the sound of the waterfall, but apart from the engine and an occasional distant dog bark, the hillside was deathly silent. Just as a green ridge seemed to block the road ahead, we heard a mighty roar and saw to our left a white sheet of water seemingly cascading from the sky. Not even the shadow of a person could be seen, just a few squirrels scavenging amidst the rubbish left behind by previous tourists. As darkness rose like the tide and engulfed the hillside, we scurried back to our stilled huts and turned on the electric lights. Only then did the raging jungle, so intent on its prey, stop closing in on us. We had our own hut, separate from the Gu family. Their hut was on the other side of the hill, out of earshot even if we shouted. Before getting into bed, I carefully shut all the windows, hoping to keep the terrifying jungle and fearsome night at bay. But the doors and windows were so simply designed, it seemed a hand pushing with sufficient force could simply open them all. To a city dweller, this seemed most unsafe, and I was extremely worried. What follows is then a night of what can only be described as sheer horror, as the sounds that seemed so comforting and familiar in Dr. Wong's childhood become terrifying to him, now a middle-aged city dweller. And I'll just read the ending. After they fled in fear come morning. A month later, I saw in the newspaper that in the jungle near Kota Tinggi, a grass cutter had been killed by a tiger. A few days later, the beast returned to feast on what remained of the corpse, only to find the police lying in wait. They ambushed and shot it. This article was a reminder that I should not be like that tiger and should never try to go back to the natural world and the amusements I'd enjoyed as a schoolboy. I am now a civilized city dweller and the primeval jungle will no longer allow my return. Thank you.
Of course, one of the things you notice in uh, the readings were tigers, also darkness, shadows, fear. And another thing that uh, was very provocative in what you read was about the gaps between um, people, between cultures, between languages, things like that. There seems to be a pattern in here from a very industrialized, very hyper-modern and prosperous city-state, and this mm, dwelling upon the darkness and the jungle. Can you folks talk about that a little bit? And is that a misperception of Singapore writers, preoccupations? Um, I is this working? Yeah, cool. Um, no, I, I think there is a, a tendency in Singaporean writing to be nostalgic for a past that never really was, a, a kind of mythical, rural idyll that I don't think really ever existed in Singapore. Um, but yeah, we, we tend to fetishize it, like, like city dwellers everywhere. You know, um, the, the cliche of, of reaching a level of affluence that makes you want to go camping because you have to be pretty comfortable in your life to believe that sleeping outdoors is, <laughs> is a nice thing to do. Um, but also, I, I think as a country that's only 50 years old, has only been independent for 50 years, um, there's a kind of self-mythology that happens. And one of the things we tell ourselves is that we came from nowhere, we came from the jungle, ignoring that it was a thriving port for centuries and um, have become this metropolis. One of the things we were talking about before was how it seems unlikely and almost ridiculous, the idea of a tiger in Singapore, forgetting that just a few decades ago there were tigers in Singapore. But if you look at the country now, it's all glass and steel towers. Every inch of it has been built on, except a tiny nature reserve. And there's no room for a tiger or really any kind of wildness anymore. So we situate it in our writing and in this idea of what we've lost or left behind. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. I'm also very interested in, I guess, you know, the appearance and reappearance of the tiger in our uh, literature. There is an early uh, short story uh, by the writer uh, Raja Ratnam, who was also, you know, for a period of time, the foreign uh, minister of uh, Singapore. Uh, but unlike many politicians in Singapore, he was very literary. <laughs> and he wrote this story about a uh, tiger that a pregnant woman met at the river when she brought her clothing, uh, brought the clothes to wash them at the river. And it became a, 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 a fantastical and yet a very powerful encounter between her and this tiger, perhaps you know, representing sexuality, a sexuality that you know, um, after her pregnancy, she may not have allowed herself to feel. And so you know, the, the idea of the wild, the untamed, uh, comes up again, I think, in, in a, a recent, more recent story by the contemporary short story writer, uh, Dave Chua we imagined uh, a tiger appearing in a block of apartments, in a block of government flats. <laughs> and of course it's ludicrous, it's absurd uh, to find a tiger hunting down you know, the inhabitants of this uh, apartment block. Uh, but a parallel story to that was that uh, it was about a breakdown of a relationship. So one can draw all kinds of parallels in the, between the social and the personal here. And so the tiger, I think, becomes in the hands of these Singaporean writers a sign of the return, perhaps, of the repressed. Uh, you know, what we have destroyed or what we have invented, as uh, Jeremy said, and then it comes back and haunts our imagination still, as if we need something more than just the glass and steel towers that uh, characterize our landscape. 
Um, yeah, um, another fascinating thing about St. Paul, I think, to anyone looking at it on the outside is the great racial and linguistic and cultural diversity of the island. Um, I, I've met many people from Singapore, however, who identify themselves as Singaporean rather than as Chinese or Malaysia or whatever it is. Can you talk a little bit about how a writer in such a situation is able to speak to a diversity of people who might still have a sense that they are uh, one people across these different languages and cultures and histories. Is that difficult for you as a writer? Um, I think, oh, sure. Um, That's off. I think one of, oh, is it? Technology. I'll use this one. I fear technology. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Well, one of the the um, preoccupying motivations behind a lot of Singapore culture, not just literature, is the construction of identity. Again, because we are such a young country, and also because, as you mentioned, a very diverse country with many streams of immigration from around Asia and more recently, really, around the world. And I think what comes out of that is rather than trying to speak to all these diverse groups, what Singaporean writers have tended to do is create a Singaporean identity that supposedly encompasses all of them. And it, it tends to, I find, often be quite shallow and, and revolve around certain signifiers, such as speaking Singlish, which is a kind of patois, mixing English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil, um, and various Chinese dialects, um, revolving around Singaporean food, revolving around Singaporean rituals um, and rites of passage, such as schooling, which we have a unified government school system, such as national service, which all men have to do, um, such as the particular ways in which you celebrate particular festivals, um, National Day, which a lot of people have participated in, and so forth. The peculiarities of the Singaporean landscape, where I think it's 85% of Singaporean live in, Singaporeans live in government housing. So we seize on these things, many writers seize on these things as markers of identity and use that as a way of saying, well, we've all experienced this and therefore we're all the same. Um, and I think that has its function in terms of saying this is who we are, but it also tends to flatten difference. And I think what will come next, now that we're a bit more secure about who we are, is to look a bit more closely at the differences between us, the differences between different groups, and acknowledge that these are valid and that we're not as homogenous in all that, and we can be different and still part of the same community. Um, I want to try to fill you in perhaps a little bit on historical background, and Jeremy can also, you know, I'm sure add in a lot more than I can. And that is, of course, you know, um, the, the four official languages of Singapore are um, English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. Even though, of course, you know, uh, that we have many other, um, um, uh, a large Indian population that speak other Indian languages besides Tamil. But the government has decided these are the four official languages. And when, you know, Singapore became independent, very quickly the ruling party decided uh, to actually abolish or to transform um, uh, Chinese and Malay schools into English language uh, teaching institutions. The idea being, you know, because Singapore is a multicultural, multilingual society, we need a lingua franca, a language that we all have in common, and English was uh, decided to be, was chosen to be the one. And also because English has obvious economic benefits of connecting Singapore into, to the international economy. And then the other languages, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil, are actually taught in schools as a second language. Uh, and the rationale for teaching them is that they carry um, important cultural values 
in a, in a case of Chinese, for example, you know, the, the values of thrift and filial res respect and so forth, filial piety and so forth. And so it's a very strange dichotomy, of course, you know, English is a kind of instrument uh, for, for unification and prosperity, and your so-called mother tongue, you know, as a carrier of values is, is a completely unt untenable dichotomy, I would say. Uh, but what that has uh, uh, enabled, I think, is a very vibrant English language uh, literature in Singapore. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, the, the literary community in Singapore is a very lively one. A lot of uh, young poets, a lot of young writers, uh, you know, coming up, writing in English. Um, and a lot of uh, independent publishers rising too, um, uh, uh, to, to publish these works and disseminate them. Of course, you know, I think that has um, actually come about too, you know, accompanied by great losses that I think uh, Jeremy uh, has alluded to. So personally, for example, I grew up in a household speaking both English and Cantonese, a Chinese dialect. Uh, but right now, I think and write only in English. I, my Cantonese is really poor, <laughs> really weak, and I, I, there's no way I can write in a script that would represent Cantonese. And that, I think, is a loss, really. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm glad you know, I have English, but you know, like many uh, people of my generation, we have lost, I think, the kind of mastery over our dialects or even over other languages spoken in, uh, in, uh, in Singapore that my parents would have. My parents could speak, you know, some Malay at least. I, I cannot. <laughs> so I think, you know, pr progress has been made uh, at a cost. When I'm trying to get North Americans to understand the different language communities in Singapore, my shorthand for this is think about the divisions but also the connections between Anglophone and Francophone writers in Canada. And that's analogous to the situations in Singapore, except there are more language groups. As a translator, I have a foot in both the English and the Chinese camps. And I have to say, it often feels that, like alongside translating the language, I'm also translating between cultures. And what is considered a typical experience in a Chinese-speaking household would be unfamiliar for an English-speaking family in Singapore, for all that they might be growing up side by side um, as neighbours. So that it are these divisions that are perhaps rendered invisible by the need to construct a homogenous identity. But the more we translate and read each other's literatures, hopefully the closer we'll get and come to understand each other. And of course, Jeremy's talking about why we all need to read translations more, because uh, this enables us to get to know people that we don't know, get to know the way they think, the way they behave, and what is common among us, as well as what is extraordinary and uh, uh, unique and significant. So with that, I'd like to just uh, turn it over to uh, you, if anyone has any questions or comments they'd like to make. Don't be shy. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if, if translation um, is becoming, I mean, more necessary, clearly, um, for, in a lot of ways, but I'm wondering if more and more um, writers are like writing in English, um, as you do, um, then is the translation a kind of movement towards um, like keeping the other dialects alive in a way? Like is that the kind of movement that you're that you're leaning towards? Does that question make sense? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that's um, I mean translation I think will always have a place. Even if it becomes archival, there's still a lot of older literature that hasn't been translated, so there'll um, always be more that needs to be brought into other languages to bring us together. But also what I have started to see in Singapore is younger writers who might have gone through an English language education, but who choose to write in other languages as a political act. And I think that's significant, that it's seen as reclaiming something, 
that they might be less comfortable writing in, say, Chinese or Malay than in English, but they're going to do it anyway because it's important as a marker of their identity. And there are certain things that they can say in that language that might not come as easily in English. So it, it's an exciting time linguistically in Singapore um, to see where we go next. But I don't feel that we're becoming more homogenous, even though the language um, has started to move that way. Yeah. Um, no, it's a very interesting question. I mean, um, when Jeremy talks about these younger writers, you know, who are proficient in English and writing in English, decided to write in other languages uh, as an act of reclamation or some part of their identity. Because personally, just speaking for myself as a writer, I have such, I think, of um, ambivalent relationship to language that I find it hard to claim anything, even when I'm writing in English. Um, I'm thinking of my writing, even though I write you know, original works, as almost an act of translation in itself. So I have written a poetic sequence called Translations of a, an Unknown Mexican Poet. They are pseudo-translations. There's no such poet. <laughs> I, I wrote those poems in English, but I thought in writing those poems in English, I was as if translating an original Mexican poet writing in Spanish that I could have known but didn't. And right now I'm actually working on a book of haiku uh, that I'm subtitling uh, translations of an insignificant Japanese poet. <laughs> uh, and again, you know, I'm writing those haikus, <laughs> but I, it is, it's with a feeling that I'm always living between cultures and can never claim either as mine, neither a culture that is based on English or a culture that's based on whatever, Japanese, you know, Spanish, what have you, or even Chinese. Um, and I think that is, of my peculiar position, but perhaps also peculiar because I grew up in Singapore, and that is something that Singapore has given me, that peculiarity. Yeah. Not as loud. Uh, so a follow-up question for you, Jeremy, about translation. You talked a little bit about um, there being a gap in the sort of a cultural divide when you translate and how that's, you have to conquer that divide. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process for you. Um, does that make sense? The process yes. of your translation. And then, Gia, a follow-up question for you about um, namelessness. It was interesting what you were talking about just now in terms of namelessness. And I wonder if it allows you any freedom or any mobility, and you're talking about ambivalence. I wonder if it's somehow related to a freedom to then enact something that you're unable to do as a named person or as a named poet? Um, so it's become less pronounced now, but the further back you go in the past, the clearer it is that there are many different Singapores, depending on which cultural group you belong to, depending on which language you speak. And I have translated a novel called Unrest about 1950 Singapore, and it became very clear that just basic things like the street names were different. There was this parallel naming system for the streets in Chinese that just ignored what the official English names were. <laughs> and they just picked the central point called Dapo Big Hill, and they called the street Big Hill Road 1, Big Hill Road 2, Big Hill. And in English, they were called things like Armenian Street and Kavanaugh Road, and it's like all erased. <laughs> we're going to have our own system. Um, that's become less prevalent as the country has become more dominated by the English language ruling class. Um, but there were these things that had to be explained, and that's like, do I just substitute the English name, or do I try to translate the Chinese name and then explain for the English speakers where this, where this actually is? Um, the names of food were different. The Chinese language schools operated differently to the English language schools, and then you'd have to explain, okay, so this is what this means, and this is why their exams are different. And high school was five years, not four, so they would do this. Um, so it was like these people living in the same country but having completely different lives, and you'd have to try and negotiate that. And not, not um, in, in one of the big debates in translation is do you familiarize or do you keep it unfamiliar, and you try and negotiate that. You try and make it comprehensible, but you don't domesticate it. 
you don't make it exactly the same. You keep that little hint of this is a diff from a different place coming into the English language. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to negotiate. And you would think you wouldn't have that in the same country, but it, it totally happens, and it's an issue. And I think your question for me was about whether I resist being named, when, yeah, about moving between languages and cultures. Yeah, I do find a great deal of freedom, I must say, in terms of you know moving you know between languages and names and cultures. Um, you know, I like many in my generation, we grew up you know um, being taught in schools the the English canon, Wordsworth, Keats, Shakespeare, and everything. And I actually did my undergraduate degree at Oxford in England and did, studied English there, read English there. So I would say that you know um, a lot of my writing actually rose from the same tradition and I do try to work out my own relationship with that tradition. Uh, but one reason why I decided not to migrate to, to England and to the US instead was because I felt I was too beholden to the tradition. I wanted to complicate a relationship, if I may use a Facebook term. <laughs> complication. It's complicated. <laughs> I like that. I like I like complications. And therefore I decided I had to move away from that and come to the US, you know, visiting it for the first time and then remaining I've remained here for, you know, I've been here for twelve years. And then in US discovering of course its own set of complications and discovering, you know, uh, you know, Mexicans living here and Japanese living here and you know how I could actually envision and conceptualize their relationship with America vis a vis my own. So it's interesting for me to examine the similarities and the differences. So yes, I think you know, the short answer is I do find a lot of freedom in that. And you know, I think there's a great deal of uh, discussion right now in literary circles about appropriation. What is right to appropriate and what is not? Is there ever a right form of appropriation? Some of us might be following the controversy, of course, about you know, this white American poet who adopted you know, a Chinese name, pseudonym in order to send out his uh, poems, um, uh, you know, so that it can be accepted according, you know, more easily. Um, you know, for me, you know, uh, when I write these pseudo-translations, you know, uh, translations of an unknown Mexican poet, or what I'm working on right now, a translation of insignificant Japanese poet, it's important for me that, you know, I was not pretending to be Mexican or Japanese, but was kind of, uh, well, it was basing what I was writing on some part of my own life in New York uh, and the strangeness that I feel towards it, which any immigrant from any other background might feel too. Um, so the part of the work that is actually very much based on my own life is, you know, this walk I take across Central Park every morning. So a lot of the haiku were actually composed in my head doing that walk. And for me, if I may, you know, um, walk that ground, you know, and I've been doing for the last 10 years, walking to school to work, uh, I felt I have, uh, I'm able to write about that in that form. So that's what I mean by being based on it. But yet, of course, that ground is finally, legally, never mind. And that is the alienation that I think I hope to convey through these pseudo translations. Yeah. So it is both being tied to a place, but at the same time, not owning a place. I think that animates uh, much, my, much of my work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'd like to thank the L Library of Congress for hosting us and to Anya, who has been our um, hostess. Thank you very much. And to you for coming. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.